Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Excellent. Uh, it's really exciting to be here. Um, I, I really, um, it's been kind of a focus of my career to sort of spread the gospel, if you will, of some of these ideas about morality and moral injury. And I especially appreciate being able to talk to folks that I don't typically talk to. So, uh, you know, I, I'm in a clinical environment and a clinical research environment, and I lecture to psychology interns, psychiatry residents, postdocs, psychologists, psychiatrists, researchers. That's really my world. Um, and I'm always edified, and I learn a great deal by getting outside that wor world, especially my experiences in the last, really, at least 20 years of doing research and partnering with uh, service members doing research and trying to um, enhance and improve the care of service members um, in theater and in garrison. Uh, so I welcome your comments. I I'm, I'm, would love to learn from you and, and um, what, what resonates with you about some of these things I'll be sharing, and, um, but also what, what doesn't fit. Um, a good deal of the, of the uh, concepts around this idea of moral injury are controversial. It's somewhat like a Rorschach. It, you know, it really depend, reactions depend on the person hearing these things. Chaplains respond a certain way. Uh, VA clinicians who are locked into a certain type of thinking about war trauma react a certain way, often negatively. Um, service members, leaders, um, I get a lot of different reactions and I learn, and I'm very welcoming of all responses. I'll share a little anecdote. I was presenting the, um, the behavioral health, I don't know, there's a behavioral health meeting of, of, the, of the Navy primarily and the, and the Marine Corps in San Diego every year. And it's, it's like eight times the size of this room. It's an enormous setting with, with uh, a lot of uh, Marines and sailors and care providers in, in the, really the entire Navy care community. And I was presenting on moral injury and I thought, uh, geez, I know what I'm talking about and I feel confident um, uh, sharing it. And I still do, but um, so after I got finished with my little thing, ideas which I'll share with you through these slides today, a um, lieutenant colonel in the Marine Corps stood up and shared that he resented in, in totality, full stop, what I was sharing and that, that his Marines could not be damaged by things that they were ordered to do, which are by definition moral and legal. And um, there was a hush, you know. Um, this guy was um, very powerful. And, um, and I responded and we, you know, we, we kind of had it out a little bit. I tried to defend myself. And um, I didn't want to not, you know, stand my ground. Uh, but it was, it was a kind of a scary moment. I'm, I'm not used to that sort of confrontation. Now the interesting, the, the interesting aftermath of, though, aftermath of that was, though, there was an article in the Stars and Stripes that said, Marine Corps rejects the moral injury, and, you know, it's like this contentious thing. And um, they quoted the, the lieutenant colonel and, and me and, and, and created a stir about it as if there's a great divide. And the reality that no one would know is that I talked to this guy after my talk, and we... we, we came together and understood, you know, he better understood where I was coming from. You know, a lot of people in the services when talking to civilians, and, you know, I know I have some legit legitimacy because I treat veterans and have done my whole career, but still there is there is a, let's face it, there is a, a, a disconnect and a, a lack of comfort uh, often. Um, but once he got through that and he understood that I was just, I just had a heartfelt desire to help, in this case, Marines and sailors, and I was, and I shared more of these ideas, which are hard to encaps, you know, encapsulate when you give a talk. He he started to appreciate it, and I got uh, an understanding of what, where he was coming from. This is a long way of saying that that is an incredibly valuable experience for me. It's a rare experience for for uh, people who are researchers and clinicians in that uh, other side of the world, the VA, 
or the post-traumatic stress world. And, and that's really unfortunate. And um, so I just want to share that a little bit. So I've got tons of slides, and I, I won't get through all of them. I, I, I had a hard time selecting uh, slides and content to share with you because I really wasn't clear on what you needed, I, to be honest. Like, I'm not sure what you need from me, what would be useful for you to hear. So I'm going to share, basically, this is a lecture that I give to trainees and psychologists and, and um, care providers in the VA and the DOD, uh, so more therapists and, and um, people doing research and, and clinical trials and, this, and the like. This is what I tell them. So you're going to get a window into what I tell them about these ideas that they, they need to think about. Okay, so I, I'm going to share. Now, this is my vantage point, and you have to understand where, where I'm coming from. Uh, but I'll share with you some of the lessons I've learned uh, kind of getting out, again, outside the VA walls and appreciating the, the service culture and what I tell people in, that, in the VA culture about that and what they need to appreciate about the military culture and ethos, because without that, they're flying blind. Um, I'll share with you why I started to study moral injury and, you know, why is that an important concept. I'll try to de define the concept and speak to its prevalence and outcomes related to it. And I'll share what we're trying to do to try to help service members um, repair moral injury and to help them with their, their PTSD from it. OK. Um, so this is something you all know. I'm preaching to the choir. But, but really, in the VA, there's still kind of a uh, it's kind of a culture of still thinking about the military as if it was Vietnam. Uh, it's tacit, it's not in any way explicit, but there's this expectation that, uh, you know, there's just dissatisfaction and, and um, people want to get out or that kind of stuff. And, and I've had, I've had the, the, really the privilege of um, working, again, as I said, with military leaders uh, especially in the Navy and the Marine Corps, but also the Army. And the things that I've learned, I try to impart. And so it's, it's super important for clinicians in the VA side to appreciate the, how powerful the social culture is, the military cult, the ethos, and how important leadership is and peer, peer bonding and the like, and how, how powerful in 99% of the cases uh, a military career is. And how, you know, one of the dynamics that, that touches upon moral injury that we deal with in, in the Marine Corps right now, where we're doing a clinical trial, and in the VA, people who got med boarded out, they're mad, they feel uh, re they're resentful because they feel that they got betrayed. And why? Because they wanted, they wanted to keep their careers. They, they, they love their work and their job. So, um, and, and there's good reason. There's, this is a time of, in our culture, where the military gets tremendous support and um, appreciation by the, about, you know, just a tremendous amount of resources, but so much attention is paid. I mean, look at the, how you're being trained um, and how that will affect people that you're leading. That's a tremendous thing. It doesn't happen, you know, in my work setting, there's, no one gets trained to be a leader, seriously, but they're leaders, and that's a problem. Um, in the culture, it's important to note that uh, this was shared earlier, but I think it's important to underscore is that this is a different time. You know, there was, I'm, I'm a child of the Vietnam generation, grew up in the 60s, and, and really at, at that time, service members were really seen with scorn, and um, unfortunately. And now it's different. The, the, the culture is very accepting of service members, honoring of them. Um, so there's not a conflation of, of, let's say, beliefs about the, the validity of these wars and their cost and the outcome with support for the troops. So that's really an important thing. OK. So one of the key things I try to impart, again, to people that need to hear this is that they need to understand that combat and operational experiences are, are complex and multidimensional. And um, in these incredibly long wars, which have taken such a toll on service members and families and communities and cultures, 
um, the just the stressors of deployments, leaving the family behind, takes a toll. Um, Non-combat roles, service support roles, or what have you, are uh, at, more at risk in a guerrilla war of insurgency for, to be exposed to potentially traumatizing experiences or moral, uh, potentially morally compromising challenges. Um, and traumas are so different in the military context than they are in the civilian world, yet PTSD as, a, as an idea, as a disorder, and its assessment and treatment are really focused on the civilian experience. And I try to, I'm trying to change that paradigm. Okay, so what, what, so, so in our work, we've, we've, we try to make sense out of all the complexity of what might happen in a, in, in a operational, you know, in, during war. And we've broken it down into three, three what we call principal harms. A principal harm is the, is the war zone event, clinically, or in a research context, that a service member or a veteran says is the most haunting for them right now and the most currently distressing experience. So they may have had 20 things they could share, but what is the most currently haunting and most distressing event? We can categorize that broadly into three different types of experiences, danger-based, loss-related, traumatic loss, and, and moral injury, which I'll describe. None of these should be elevated more than any other of them. Unfortunately, life threat, danger, is the sine qua non for PTSD, and, and it's the, at the core of our understanding of post-traumatic outcomes. And that's terribly deficient um, when it comes, especially to treating service members and veterans. Um, traumatic loss, is a completely different phenomenology. It's, it's the worst, it's the worst human experience. It's, it's, it's a na it, war zone loss, especially to someone close to you, is analogous to losing, like I, if I lost my child to violence, it's the worst human experience. And associated with the most horrific outcomes over the long haul sometimes. Um, added to all this soup is, is again, the, what should not be ignored is just the, ge the general stress level and adversities of deploying, um, especially on the family. Okay, another thing that I, ch I tell people is how important it is to appreciate the impact of combat and operational traumas and stressors or what have you from a multidisciplinary standpoint, ideally an interdisciplinary standpoint. Interdisciplinary um, knowledge is egalitarian. Nobody has, nobody's, uh, you know, sitting at the head of the table. It's not a psychiatrist, it's not a psychologist. Everybody's got input and everybody understands the other's perspective. Unfortunately, psychologists have totally dominated the discourse about PTSD and have not reached out to others that know about the other types of impacts, biological behavioral, social, uh, relational, spiritual, and the effects of, uh, on the family and, and the culture. So the impact of trauma is multidimensional, and the, the, the study needs to be, and, and what's missing here really, in terms of, of, of the, let's say, the disciplines that need to get involved are you all. And there really is an unfortunate you know, there's a lot of VA clinicians that get trained and they, they never talk to uh, a, a senior NCO who's um, had a lot of deployments and, and a lot of responsibility and, and is very wise and, and could, to get feedback about what they know and what they're doing. And, and that's a terribly unfortunate state of affairs. Okay. Uh, so as I was saying, the PTSD is dominated by psychological concepts. Basically, a traumatic event needs to be a life threat experience, which, which in technical terms is like an unconditioned, it's like a shock in a, in a, in a, if, in a, if you were thinking about conditioning. And the effects of that shock leads to conditioned reactions, to reminders of the shock. And that's really, that's the fundamental core beginning of PTSD. That's where it came from as a fear-based disorder. It's, it still resides in this idea that 
you need to have high fear to have PTSD. And um, I won't go into any more details, it's quite clinical. The, the idea of a trauma as being a life threat experience and, and, and affecting biology, you know, there's, there's, there really are de um, predictable downstream impacts of intense panic level fear on the body and the mind. And the study of that and the treatment of that, has, it, there has been huge advances over the course of my career since 1987. There's, it's really led to a revolution in the, in the um, thinking about PTSD and caring for it, chiefly from a civilian standpoint. Um, so therapies that are designed to target this high fear type thing and that da those downstream effects, you know, the, the um, author was talking about how, you know, the, the sound of the horn and coming out and, you know, that's, that's all fear-based, right? Unfortunately, the evidence for, although the evidence is incredibly, um, actually ridiculously great, to, uh, for existing evidence-based treatments for civilian-based, fear-based traumas. The evidence for helping service members and veterans with PTSD is very poor. So the question is, why is that the case? And I, I have spent uh, a lot of time thinking about that and trying to solve that problem. Um, it's, it's a fundamentally important question to answer, and if we don't answer it, we're doing a disservice to our service members and veterans. Um, okay, so my personal assumptions, again, I share these with care providers and researchers, uh, but you should think about these things or know what we're thinking about, I guess. Um, I suspect as a culture and as a care community, uh, many outcomes, many of the dysfunctional outcomes or the psychopathological outcomes are going to be delayed. There's always a gap between, or an important gap, of risk that happens between active duty service and VA care or, or veteran status. Many don't use the VA. That's an understandable time of risk because you're losing your role and your sense of purpose and the good feelings that arise from being with your peers and that, the whole social life of that and feeling pride in what you're doing, what have you, and you might have a job that you're unhappy about. But I think a lot of outcomes will be delayed I also assume, and there's evidence to suggest this, that, and it's certainly the reason, one of the reasons why we need to stop thinking about danger as the only thing that's going to harm service members, that there's going to be great resilience. The, resilience is defined as the ability to bounce back from stressors or traumas. There's going to be great resilience to danger-based experiences in the military uh, in, during war. That is that most people, if that was their focal prominent sort of thing that's haunting for them or distressing, that is, that's recoverable for a variety of reasons which I'll, I'll des describe. By contrast, traumatic loss, as I was saying, is, a, is, one of, is really the worst human experience. Um, but added to that moral injury, which I'll describe, those are problems that have, whose scars are run deep, maybe hidden. Um, and because we don't think about those sources of harm, we're, we're not prepared to see it and address it. And certainly loss and moral injury require completely different thinking. Um, and that's kind of the focus of what I do. Um, the experience of guilt from and, and feeling culpable for the loss of a fellow service member is not something that you can just talk a lot about and be okay with. It's not, and, but you can. I mean, this thing about talking a lot and being exposed to the narrative of what happened to you, that, doing that over and over again, is, there's, it's, there's unequivocal evidence that that helps with high fear experiences. But if you just continually talk about how guilty you are and how sad you are, that, it, it, the brain doesn't work that way. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily reduce. You need another way of thinking about helping people. And moral injury, the shame from that, the potential for self-handicapping, which I'll talk, um, feeling undeserving, needs a different type of thinking. Okay, the last thing I'll say from this slide, which is important to appreciate, and it's, it's related to this idea of the, the need to be multi, at least multidisciplinary in thinking about 
uh, service members and veterans is that as psychologists, you know, they have the, these, these, these great hammers, or they think they're great hammers, so that the, they see the nail. And the nail is some kind of intrapsychic, something inside the brain and the thought process and the emotions shared of a service member or veteran that they need to talk about and make sense out of and get some feedback about, that that's, that's all that's needed. And that's, that is a, a terribly short-sighted and unidisciplinary emphasis, uh, focus on change. And that it, it's impossible to help our nation's service members and veterans who are harmed by war zone stressors and traumas if we just attend to what's going on in their head. Real change requires doing things in, in their world outside of a therapy session. And I'll talk about some of those things. OK, so this came up earlier. Um, and I'd like to share some things about that, this issue of why um, have we, let's say, the care community or the research community at least, or maybe uh, the service culture too, um, why has it taken us so long to address these things that, have been, that are universal and timeless? Um, there's a variety of reasons. Um, and, and what I can say with some pride is that we're changing the culture and there's m much more you know, ease about moral injury in particular, unlike last year, the year before, the year before. Uh, there's still a lot, of, a lot of reluctance in the service culture, uh, and understandably so. so you know, the, the reluctance comes from like, w wait a minute, you're saying that someone's going to have a mental disease because they did their job? L a legitimate perspective. Um, from my vantage point in our world, like I was saying, this fear, this idea that you, you, you have to be frightened to have PTSD, um, it has really blinded um, researchers and care providers. I don't think we've asked the right questions. We're, we're starting to. Shame, as this was discussed earlier today, shame has prevented service members and um, shame and also inadequacy has prevented service members and veterans from sharing their experience so that the public could know, care providers could know, you all could know. The more you know, the you're, you have a tremendous heart you're going to want to do something about it. Congress would want to do something about it. Um, but I don't think as a culture and in the society at large, given that 1% serve, there is great awareness. I think that will change. Uh, care providers may feel helpless or unprepared to deal with stories that are um, very hard to hear. They're not sure how to respond. So that, that may have prevented some dialogue about that. Early in my career, what we used to say is like, well, let's talk, let's have this uh, patient talk to the chaplain. You know, there's this real stark boundary. That's a religious matter, you know. That's not going to cut it. Um, and the other problem is that we might be judgmental about these things, moral transgressions. We're all, we're, we all are judgmental about others' behaviors, but we can't help service members and veterans unless we come from a place of compassion um, and forgiveness, really. And that's what we need to promote. Okay, so I've tried to, in, in a couple different ways, to, de to define this idea of moral injury. This was the first attempt, which didn't make the cut, but it's worth talking about because this, this, my original idea, when I thought about moral injury, I was thinking about my uh, clinical experience with Vietnam veterans, which is really how I started my career. And as a, as a person in the culture, the, the idea of some, a small but salient percentage of Vietnam veterans going off the grid and disengaging from society and filling the jails and what have you, and, and um, anticipating the possibility of, the, of long wars and uh, of, of unclear outcomes, um, I, I thought that, that moral injury could be this sort of a broken moral compass. That is, that you, you did things or saw things that, that kind of broke your understanding of how things work and your expectation that people will do the right thing or you, can, you, you do the right thing, that you have goodness in your heart, you know, 
And um, once that's broken, you might, might disengage from moral expectations. Um, so that was the original idea. I, there's still some validity to that. And I think that the delayed outcomes of these wars I, I, I've talked about before, I think that we don't know yet whether there will also be kind of a post-9-11 wars section of society veterans that go off the grid or, or um, uh, start to fill the jails. Um, something we need to watch out for. This is the working definition that we've published, that, we, that the VA is, is um, comfortable disseminating. Um, it's worth just saying out loud. Um, so moral injury is the lasting psychological, biological, spiritual, behavioral, and social impact of perpetrating, failing to prevent, or bearing witness to acts that transgress deeply held beliefs, moral beliefs and expectations. Fairly broad, but it's a good starting place. The key here is transgression. And in order for a transgression, it's, events aren't transgressive. It's reaction to those events. So I'd like to say that, that war zone events are potentially morally injurious, but they're not inherently morally injurious. You need to have the perceived transgression. So we've done, a, I've, I'll share some research we've done on the aftermath of killing in the war zone in the VA, and that research has, has been distorted somewhat because people who are not in the know take it as, well, killing is harmful. And that's not the case. Killing, as was discussed earlier, it's, it depends on the context. Um, perhaps it depends on the proximity and, and your ability to discern the humanity of who you're killing. And, and I, I thought that was a great point earlier. But events aren't inherently damaging. All right, well, let's see if this works. OK. So uh, taking a step back just to, to kind of emphasize the distinction between danger, life threat, and moral injury. If you're interested, this slide just sort of shows you that there are different things that happen behaviorally and psychologically. And there are di different needs that arise from loss. There's certainly, a, uh, if you think about it, there's a completely different need that arises if you're really scared and you can't calm down um, and you don't want to go out again than if you lost someone that you love and that you, you depended on for your well-being and they depended on you for their well-being. It's a different need. On a human level, there's a different need that arises in the short term and the long term. Yet the field is focused on life threat. There's a different need that arises from a uh, feeling that you have transgressed, a need to be punished. OK, so what, what have we found in our research that is potentially morally injurious? That's important because, again, it's potential, not inherent. There's nothing inherent about um, events. Um, well, there's prescribed. ROE killing, we've done some research on that. That can be potentially morally injurious. Uh, collateral damage to human beings. Uh, bearing witness to intense human suffering. There's no one that has, that has um, articulated the damage that could happen from bearing witness to carnage and um, the aftermath of violence than Romeo Dallier, who was the head of the peacekeeping operation in Rwanda, and he, General Dallier, and he wrote a book, tremendous person, and um, he wrote a book about his experiences. And I wish I had a quote here, um, but it was peacekeeping. wasn't His job wasn't to um, harm an enemy. It, um, you're not supposed to take sides. That was mentioned earlier, and. His reaction on a human level, and, and as, he's described, as he describes it in this book, you could understand how powerfully harming that is, especially for a service person who wants to help, can help, but is unable to. So helplessness can be a theme to the, the sort of bearing witness to, to grave human suffering. Um, 
And then there's the potential for proscribed violence, acting out, uh, behaving brutally. Um, and then betrayal, which is a, 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 something I get asked a lot about by, from VA clinicians because they're, they, they feel like they can't help their patients because they're just mad. And, and they don't feel like it's their job to help, help themselves. It's just like they got screwed. So betrayal by leaders, if a leader made a capricious decision, I resonated with what the general said this morning. It's powerful. Um, you have so much responsibility. But I'm, I'm, I will tell you that perhaps it's unavoidable, but, but th there are people that you're going to be in charge of that will feel betrayed. And, and um, a lot of it comes with needing to leave the service. Um, but this, this, it's powerfully scarring and it and it's, can be all consuming to feel like very resentful and angry and to be what is known as externalizing. Like you feel like, I, I didn't do this, so why should I be in therapy or whatever? It's like, you know, I'm the victim. That's a, that's a very hard problem to tackle. I wish there was a way that you all could help service members before they leave the service, uh, um, feeling resentful and angry. Um, I doubt that there, would, there could ever be a conversation, really, um, given how the, some, some service members feel when they're leaving. Okay. Oh, I skipped something. All right. I won't go over the details of this. Um, we've done a series of, of studies looking at the aftermath of killing. So some of these are based on just getting almost like focus groups together of... Uh, Iraq and Afghanistan veterans and Vietnam veterans together and um, getting them to talk about, you know, what, killing experiences, what it was like, their, their aftermath and what have you. And what we've shown is that there's the potential for harm by, uh, from these experiences. And that's a conflict because it's, it's an occupational hazard. Um, Someone asked about prevention earlier. I think it was over here. That's a great question. I would not lose that question. I think prevention is possible. Uh, I think part of the reason why loss and moral injury is more toxic is that there aren't rituals. There aren't conversations. Uh, but in the military, there's great training and preparation, very hard and realistic preparation for warrior roles. And doing hairy stuff is consistent with the warrior culture and ethos. So you can be almost proud about it, or maybe really proud about it, and excited about it. And you can share those stories, but try sharing stories of um, feeling like you let somebody down, or actual culpability for loss. Um, anyway, so, so killing is one of those things that can be damaging in all sorts of ways. Creates r greater risk for suicide, suicidal ideation, depression, PTSD, substance abuse. Uh, for those of you who may want to know, we, we, so part of the scientific study of these things, you've got you to first define, it, define a construct, define a, an idea you know, that everybody can agree on, that makes sense, um, and then you've got to find ways of measuring it. So we, we developed and published um, a measure of morally injurious experiences that we use in our research. If, if anybody is interested, you can email me. Um, this is an interesting, I'm, I'm, I was heartened that, that earlier there was a conversation about this. So there's something called appetitive aggression, and it's this um, real phenomenon of human beings having very old brains, uh, in addition to a, a, a more evolved part of your brain, but we're, we're very much driven by our old brains. And in our old brains, hunting and killing was, is, we're hardwired to, at some level, often very explicitly and automatically, it's not your choice per se, there's a pleasurable aspect to that. Um, so being predatory and goal-directed in a high-threat environment uh, where you have mastery and control, that's powerful and it's reinforcing and it feels good. Um, it hasn't been discussed, it's kind of a, one of these things that's kind of hard to talk about. Um, but there, there's even, sex, you, you hear off, you know, some reports of sexual pleasure 
from killing. Again, hardwired. It's not a choice. And um, so the prediction that I have is that that's probably the most hard, the hardest thing to uh, accommodate, which is to, to accept as part of who you are. You know, how do you how do you um, regain your humanity after feeling that? You know, and that's something that we have to tackle and, and be realistic about. Interesting study, this last thing, I mean, I, there, there's like one study of this phenomenon, and it was with Nazis, actually, who um, had, you know, who were evaluated for PTSD, you know, many, many years after World War II. And those who reported a lot of appetitive aggression, that is excitement and good feeling, if not arousal, uh, were less likely to get PTSD. So food for thought. Okay, so uh, are there morally injurious experiences in war? That's one of those duh things. Of course, there are, no one, I don't think anyone would dispute that, that there are potentially morally injurious uh, experiences. And, and what we underscore in our work is that service members are uniquely at risk for moral injury in part because they're trained to be so highly moral and ethical, unlike any organization I've ever um, been exposed to. Um, it's built in and hardwired, and um, so when there is the experience of transgression, it's even, it's even, you're, you hit, you're hit even harder. Um, this was a mental health advisory re report, which is a team of, uh, in this case it was um, Army personnel from Walter Reed at the time, who, who went in, in theater and asked um, soldiers and Marines you know, what they were up to. And, and these were the, some of the things that were, were reported. And this makes me feel a great deal of pride that, you know, I live in a country that the military was not, did not intend to be blind to these things. So, so the leadership had to see these things and wanted to see it. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't have been evaluated. And these, these are the things that were reported in this mental health advisory team. Uh, for example, 45% of these uh, service members felt that non-combatants should be treated with dignity and respect. Um, 31% indicated that they had in, um, insulted civilians. Now again, potentially morally injurious. Okay, other signs of prevalence. We've, I'm part of this consortium uh, that the DOD funded to do clinical trials of psychotherapies for PTSD in, the, in Garrison. So these, this work happens at Fort Hood. And um, so what we do is we, we, we determine the principal harm most currently haunting and distressing experience, and then we categorize it, and it's categorizable. And these are the events that have led to PTSD. So, so if, you, if one of your questions is whether a morally injurious experience can lead to PTSD, the answer is 100% yes, as is the case with loss. And this was the breakdown. It's a little more complicated than it needs to be. Um, the last three are these, the, the morally injurious, but the potentially morally injurious experiences. Actually, these, are, these were morally injurious by definition because they, they were traumatizing. It's a pretty high percent for these soldiers, and th these are treatment-seeking soldiers in garrison at Fort Hood. In another study, uh, we piloted a therapy that, I, if there's time, I'll share with you uh, to try to target loss and moral injury uh, with Marines at Camp Pendleton, and this was the breakdown of events reported in in these treatment-seeking Marines. Life threat, less. Now, Marines are perhaps unique in the sense that they may be less likely to endorse a danger-based experiences uh, experience. Um, so, is there a syndrome? This is, uh, so when I get interviewed by the media, the, uh, this is the question they want answered. They basically want to look for a mental disorder and um, you know they want they want me to say moral injury is this, and it's in the DSM, and it's a psychiatric condition. Um, it was never my intention in, for this work to develop another disorder. Um, we, we've already overly medicalized um, post-traumatic adjustment, um, in my opinion. Um, too too quick to, to identify mental illness. PTSD is a mental illness. And um, that term is not used because it's kind of unattractive. But it is a mental illness, uh, like schizophrenia. 
It's a formal mental illness. I did not want to generate another formal mental illness. But there are some predictable things that we have seen and that we, we've predicted, um, or that we would predict. One is, fundamental to PTSD is this, really is this idea of being haunted by a life event. The whole thing, if you just look at it the right way, it's about what happens to the body, mind, and spirit if you're haunted. And so, with a morally injurious experience, you're going to be haunted by it. And, and that's manifested in these re-experiencing symptoms you hear about in the PTSD. So th there's overlap of PTSD and, and whatever syndrome might occur in terms of moral injury, in addition to PTSD, let's say. Um, then there's shame and guilt. Um, guilt as a symptom was, the, was in the original DSM-3 definition of PTSD, which was, which was born from Vietnam veterans. Um, rap groups and such, and um, it didn't make the cut in DSM uh, four, and and so, and in five, it's it's conceptualized only as a victim, um, in a victim kind of frame, um, like guilt that you don't deserve, and it's irrational guilt, and that's unfortunate. There's a lot of guilt, and which comes from culpability that we can't deny as care providers um, that there's real experience culpability for that. And then the VA community is, is basically 100% prepared to see a transgression as not entailing real culpability. And, and that's a problem. I think that in many ways we have to start with the reality of the service member. And often culpability is in that um, context. And when you feel culpable, a loss is not a loss. It is a profound guilt-inducing experience. Um, and then the shame, shame is about self-loathing, moral injury. It's, some, it's ready, you know, easy for anyone to think about moral injury as a, as a shame-inducing kind of experience. Um, and then there's some downstream behavioral effects that you may not see in the service culture, you might see in the VA more, which is not caring whether you have a successful life. Self care kind of goes out the window, or um, actual self-harm, driving too fast, um, poor self-care, uh, and, and, then, and then frank self-handicapping, like getting intoxicated uh, the day you have to take, uh, have a job interview or something like that. Stemming from this idea that you're not deserving, and so that off, often leads clinically to a, maybe a couple steps forward and many steps back. And then there's the spirituality deficits. There, there may be anger at God, f f lost faith. Um, it's kind of about this idea of theodicy. Why would God let that bad stuff happen? Um, and the potential for anger and aggressive behaviors. OK, so th the challenge is, uh, I won't talk about prevention. That's another conversation. But, but how do you repair moral injury? And in, in our work, um, there really is a danger for VA clinicians to, to see behaviors as either contextual, that is, this was you then, doesn't speak to you as a total person. You gotta, you gotta speak, you, gotta, you have to understand who you are now and moving forward. In other words, it, it just sort of something that happened then. You're not really culpable. Um, if you think that you, if you feel bad about yourself, there's some distorted thinking there. Um, there's either that kind of thinking and there's the, a tacit expectation that if people do really harming things, and let's say really bad acting out things, really bad acts of transgression in the war, war zone, that that's like psychopathy. That like you're acting like a psychopath, which is that you don't have a moral, you don't have goodness, you don't really care. Um, that's a real problem. But that's, that's, there's kind of an undercurrent of that. And that counter to that way of thinking, in our model, if you are in pain and you're seeking help, by definition, you have goodness. And there is hope, regardless of the transgression. Um, and that it is possible for you to reclaim that goodness and to, to find some peace and some forgiveness. So that's fundamental. Um, and in that model, we, we, we cannot be judgmental. We cannot be jud judgmental. Another assumption is that goodness is reclaimable. Because if you're in pain about something you did or failed to do, let's say, 
you're in pain because it's, what you did is, is counter to your value system. And that value system has a core morality and a core, core personal goodness. Um, so there are two routes to moral repair, healing, recovering. One is sharing, disclosing, meaning making. And the other, which is much more challenging but much more important, is just doing repairing things in your life, in your world. Um, connecting with others, giving back, and the like. How much time do I have? Five minutes? Okay. So I'll just end here um, and just share the, the, the outlines of a psychotherapy we developed called Adaptive Disclosure. Uh, we have a book coming out. It's on this slide, Gil, Guilford Publications. And this is a book where we, we kind of, uh, which we basically tried to change the paradigm of psychotherapy, at least, for service members and veterans. And we developed this therapy that, that in one therapy, we individualize the care uh, based on the principal harm. If it's fear-based, danger-based, then we know what to do. There's you know, a real existing technology for that. If it's loss, we do some different t types of procedures. Um, and then if it's moral injury, we, we do even different things. So we acknowledge loss and moral injury. We treat it differently. Um, we piloted this uh, therapy, and we have a, a current clinical trial in the Marine Corps. Um, the, the thing I'll end by saying is that what's dr drastically different in this approach is one of the things that led me to actually to think of these new strategies was the fact that the reality is that most care providers are young. They're not sufficiently trained about the military culture and ethos, and um, they aren't um, easy to talk to, you know, <laughs> certainly inherently. And um, they can get there. Um, so we, we took some of the therapy elements basically out of the hands of the psychotherapists, or at least out of their mouths. And what we did was, we, in adaptive disclosure, we have service members and ultimately veterans have an imaginal conversation. If it's a loss, we have the, ha, they have an imagine with their eyes closed, they have a real-time conversation with the lost friend. And the idea is to confess and share all the deep, dark, and awful things that happened that led up to it, that, um, and one, one's own reports of personal responsibility if they exist. And also confess to the friend how, how you have been doing, what this event means to you, and how you have, are going to go about your life now. And usually what gets told is how you, you should not be happy, you shouldn't be successful, and you need to suffer. And then the, eventually there's a, a, a similar conversation, if you will, with this lost person through the voice of the patient about what their reaction is. What do they want from you? Um, if it was reversed, what would you want from them? If it's moral injury, we have a, the, the dialogue occurs with a forgiving, compassionate, and moral authority. And that also entails a stark, poignant, evocative confession. But it doesn't end there. It's also a conversation about what you have done since this event and how it's affected your life and what it means to you. And you get feedback from this compassionate, moral authority. If you can think of somebody who's been compassionate, and forgiving in your life, that means that you have a core of goodness. They saw that in you. And what it means is that they will, can um, provide you feedback through your own voice, because you'll know what they're going to say um, about, how, well, that was awful, and that's unacceptable, and they're going to be you know, aghast about certain events. But they're still in, they still have your back. They still think that you can repair this, that you're going to have to give back you know, volunteer your time, whatever, um, and find goodness again. So the, and we just do this to start a process because the ultimate change is in, in the world of, that service members and veterans live in. So I'll end there and take questions, I hope.